how IT can affect and hopefully make better the health system that we have. Uh, first, just a couple of logistics. Uh, I'd like to uh, inform you that we will have our next seminar Wednesday, February the 20th at 4 p.m. Not in this room, but where all the other seminars took place in Data Center 1302. So hopefully we won't get you too confused going back and forth between them. Uh, as well, if you haven't registered for today, uh, would you please let me know uh, before you leave today? And if you'd like to be uh, informed about upcoming events and are not part of our uh, email uh, notification, uh, please let me know about that and we'll get you on the list right away. So, uh, what is the seminar series all about? Well, if you had not been with us before, it really is to examine the reality and the dream of using information technology to make our health system uh, more efficient and effective. Uh, we're looking at the health system as the patient. So we examine the patient. Uh, we've, in other uh, seminars uh, leading up to this, we've uh, discovered what may be wrong, uh, discuss the diagnosis, uh, suggested some treatment, and today we're going to look at the prescription. How much IT is enough? Uh, for our agenda today, uh, David Johnson will introduce our speaker, and then our speaker, of course, will speak, and we'll have a moderated discussion after that. So, without any more ado, Thank you, Shirley. I'm just delighted to have the uh, honor of introducing uh, Dominic uh, to you. Uh, many of you know uh, Dominic, um, and we are just so pleased to be part of our wonderful enterprise. Uh, his title is intriguing, isn't it? How much IT is enough? Well, let me give you my two answers to that. Uh, the first answer is a whole lot more than we have at the present time. And my second answer is I'm not sure how much more, although it's a lot more. But my third answer is uh, the best person I know to answer that question for us is Dominic Covey. And I'm so pleased that Dominic is going to speak on that today. Let me just underline the importance of this topic and then just a word or two on uh, Dominic. Uh, the very last thing I did before I left my guest come over here was a letter to uh, the editor an op ed piece in the National Post with respect to uh, broadband connectivity across uh, the country and attempting to make the case for one of our great dilemmas in. Uh, establishing uh, this national dream of connecting every community in Canada to the broadband. And 80% of Canadian communities currently do not have broadband. Broadband can be defined as interactive video. Uh, the kind of thing that's awfully helpful with respect to uh, health informatics or IT and health. Um, is people really don't understand what it can do for them. Uh, and uh, there is this important drive to demonstrate the important economic and social benefits that can come from this connectivity. If we just take help alone, and Dominic will be focusing on that, we Canadians currently spend about $80 billion of taxpayers' money on health care. And as we know again from headlines in today's newspapers, there's great questions about how well we spend that, how much more we're going to have to spend, and so on. If we just took 1% of that $80 billion, that makes up to $80 million, uh, and invested it uh, in uh, in IT, I uh, can't imagine the increased benefits to healthcare and health communities that would be uh, quite dramatic. And just to complete the link with connectivity, if in fact we have those applications to demonstrate how uh, broadband connectivity could help every one of the communities in this country, especially the 80% who aren't currently connected, I think we have a very easy case uh, in making about a $1.5 billion dollar public investment over the next five or six years to achieve it. Now to Dominic. Dominic has had uh, over three decades of experience uh, working in this problem. So this, uh, as this is the title of the match, is one of the joke on the United Nations president of creation. He has been uh, there from the very beginning of uh, IT applications to health, at least in the modern form. Uh, he has uh, seen all aspects of uh, the environment, uh, which is uh, pertinent uh, to IT and health. Uh, they've been an important member of the uh, research uh, hospital network, an important member of universities, and uh, has been involved in his own uh, consulting and uh, entrepreneurial concerns of bringing uh, IT developments uh, into practice. Dominic uh, is a multimedia person par excellence. He's the author of uh, six books, uh, 250 articles, I think 17 uh, television type uh, 
videos and uh, two or three television programs. And as you see today, is continuing to exploit, exploit information technology to uh, present these ideas uh, in every aspect of multimedia. We're delighted that Dominic is associated uh, with our computer science department, with our faculty of applied health sciences group, uh, and is helping to lead uh, the University of Waterloo initiative in information technology and we look forward to Dominic so much to what you're helping to tell us today. I always like it when you get applause before you speak. Uh, I'm not this tall, but I'm going to stand on this. Uh, I just wanted to not show off. The, uh, because of the way the screen works, it'll be easier for me to see this, and you'll see more of me. Think of the pleasure of that. Uh, thank you, David. I really, I really appreciate the kind comments. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, you may have a different answer to your uh, uh, questions related to how much should be invested in IT at the end of this presentation. I'm hoping it will stimulate quite a bit of thinking. Well, I also want to say I'm not an economist. It's the last thing in the world I am. Uh, I am very interested in the economics of IT, but uh, I want to make that clear. And the other point I want to make is I tried to make this a presentation that wasn't too academic or, or too general, and hopefully I've hit the mark, and, uh, but it's a challenging audience. How many people here think that IT saves the health system money? Put your hand up. How many think on the other side of the coin but it doesn't save the health system money. Put your hand up. Okay. I can tell you what I know about the answer to this question, but I can't prove it either way. N none of you can. Uh, overall, you're going to find here that we don't have any evidence to support either contention. What's worse, it's not the right question. Because the cheapness, if you want, of the system, if it puts out patients that aren't living, is not really worth it. And the idea here is we should be looking at other at outcomes of patients. Uh, one of the extra added values of this talk are these little definitions I found. And so just to give you a little relief for me, you get a chance to read these. They define a whole series of careers as I go through the talk. And uh, this one's about programmers that you can read for yourself. Let's look at the health system situation. I want to thank Ron Kazarowski, uh, Phillips Medical, for the next few colored slides. Uh, very similar to the ones that uh, uh, John Oliver showed. Notice that in 1979, we spent 19 $0.1 billion on health in Canada. And notice the level of capital and uh, uh, medication spending. If you look now at a closer time, 1999, we're spending $87 billion. And look at the difference. The capital expenditures have dramatically shrunk, and the drugs have, uh, costs have almost doubled. Quite a, a significant shift. There are other shifts as well. But for the purpose of, of our talk, I just wanted to focus on those two. A number of us, I see quite a few of the age that I am in this audience, are at that sort of little square edge to the, on the uh, right side, uh, from your side, of the diagram there. Uh, the bunch of people, uh, the, the population bunch from the people after the war. And that was the, that's the distribution in 1999 that we currently have at that bump. What happens is by, by 2020, we have all moved out. Those of us who haven't died are still alive, but making up a big bump, a further big bump to the right. Look at the change in the area under the curve, left of, uh, sorry, right of 54 on, on your, the way you're looking at it. Huge number of older people in our population and proportionally fewer younger people. What's worse is that we know from our work to date that the cost of healthcare, or the healthcare spending is age dependent. And then we spend most of the money on people in, if we're older in the health system. So if you take these two curves and multiply them together, we're facing an astounding problem in the next 20 years. Some other statistics. We're going to have a large number more seniors. They're going to double in the people who are actually in the workforce. So, uh, the Canadians over 65 consume about 50% of all health care expenditures. It'll increase to 67% by 2030. We've historically, though, as a country, underfunded technology. One of the ways in which we control the health system costs is to not have quite as many CTs as we seem to need, or computer tomographs, or, or, uh, or magnetic resonance imaging units, MRIs. We're really down there among the world population. And it's a shame, too, because you know, despite what we are doing, and in spite of this, or because of this, perhaps, we have an embarrassing infant mortality rate. We're not the greatest healthcare system in the world by any means. For those of you who are statisticians, this is a definition of, of your career. I'll give you a little map of the way I'm going to go through this talk. I'm going to talk about 
four different pathways, and I'm going to bring them all together at the end in a in a, to a destination. Think of a bunch of roads converging. We'll look at the, what's called the productivity paradox. Next, the nature and spend of spending in IT and health in this province, in Ontario. Some reflections from my own experience as a consultant, which is about 80% US, 20% Canadian. My own, uh, just a philosophical slide that says what the health system should be like in a, on a sort of a philosophical level. And finally, what we get out of this when all the different roads come together. Those are really the mathematicians, the actuary definition. I like this one particularly. From Lawrence Peter. Measuring productivity. A serious issue, but really two parts of this issue. When people often ask the question, does IT save money, much the way I did at the beginning. Really, uh, that, that question is, does it enable it to operate more efficiently? So a lower level of cost. And obviously, we want to produce services at the lowest possible levels of cost or widgets if you're a manufacturing organization. So more is produced per dollar of, of cost. Does it save lives or reduce sickness? In other words, does, does IT contribute in any way to patient outcomes? And can we at all show that? Another kind of objective, produce a, a better widget, or a, I call it Weller, patient. Better is produced for the dollars that are input to the system. And of course, you could put them together. We might want to produce Weller patients at a lower cost, or the same level of wellness at a, a lower cost of care. General economic model for productivity is we have a whole bunch of inputs, and we produce product or products. Productivity is the amount of output produced per unit of input. Very simple definition. There are problems with that definition, though, to make sure all the inputs are there and make sure the proper output is there. It isn't how many people we churn through a system. It's also things like customer satisfaction, or in this case, good health outcomes. One of the problems we have is we need a definition of hospital output that focuses on the changing or maintaining health status. That does not exist right now. Most of what's been done in the statistics that we can access through CIHI, for example, in any of the empirical studies are things like bed days. How many days a person spent in bed, length of stay kind of measures. How many treated patients there were. How many discharges there were. And they're used as proxies for the productivity of the health system. None of those relate to that word better, whether the patient's any better leaving than he or she was coming in. They're process measures, not measures of true outcome. And for example, there are measures like that. There are many measures. I even think work that's been done in applied health sciences uh, in certain areas applies here. Uh, one example is the Malmquist Productivity Index incorporates things like health status into the productivity. So if we look at cataract programs, which is a, a particular paper that's an interesting one on cataract surgery, we find out that the, that the Malmquist Index shows that the productivity of uh, cataract surgery has improved enormously despite the fact that the cost of, of surgery has gone way up. And the reason is we're producing better outcomes. And if you look at things like visual acuity and the ability to read, we're actually doing better. We're spending more money but producing a better outcome. So we have to measure both of those, th those aspects, numbers plus the quality of the product itself. Product of the health system is healthy patients, and we call those outcomes or good outcomes. It should improve efficiency. IT should improve efficiency. It would be nice. And there's in, uh, the dollars per outcome and effectiveness, and that's really the key part of the equation. Improve patient health status through the health system. One problem is we don't evaluate IT or the health processes themselves versus the savings they create or versus patient outcomes. That's not done now on any systematic basis. Little tiny studies of specific you know, areas, but generally speaking, even those are in question, as you'll see. We measure only inappropriate proxies, not patient outcomes. And we spend hundreds of millions of dollars doing the evaluation. These comments come from a paper by uh, Crowley and Zittner uh, at, at, from the Ames Project out in Nova Scotia. And a paper called Operating in the Dark, which I think is a very nicely named paper, uh, which just won, the, I think it was the Fisher Prize, an international prize for a literature that affects things. And if you don't think it's affected anything, look at Mazinkowski's report. He quotes it quite liberally. Further things like, why does this happen? What is the issue? Well, Zittner and, and Crowley indicate that the problem is really a conflict of interest. The health system, federal and provincial, have a monopoly on the delivery of health care. They also monopolize data gathering, the measuring instruments, 
and the evaluation. The comment they make is despite large expenditures on health information, no hospital can give me a meaningful estimate of how many patients got better, worse, or stayed the same. So we're running a boiler without any dials on it. We don't know if it's working well or not. CIHI received a large amount of money recently, but it's unable to estimate the total expenditures on health information in Canada, even that part of it, which would seem relevant. And note that a large hospital spends a million dollars a year, 800,000 to $1 million a year, abstracting charts, which means looking back at what was done to a patient and sending that into our central repository. What I'm telling you is none of that data tells us how well the patient is when the patient exits the system. Another career path, the psychologist. Continuing on, on this, the, the productivity paradox, uh, route one, the pathway I'm going to take, series of pathways I'm going to take you down is the productivity paradox itself. Robert Solo said we see computers, this is in the 80s, we see computers everywhere but in the productivity statistics. So if you think there's real evidence that computers are really improving things, this is what's going to be brought into question here. Brindelson in the, in the communications of the ACM, a seminal article in 1993 said, that improvements in productivity are not keeping pace with the magnitude of the investment in IT. He proposed four causes. Mismeasurement, we don't know how to measure productivity, which is a problem. Lags, it being, the effects are being delayed. Redistribution, we have improved something and caused somebody else trouble. That may be a, an effect. And potentially mismanagement. We're not using the technology properly. But look at the, look at the reality. The output, which is pointed to by the arrow, is if anything gone down, the productivity has gone down over those years, but look at the magnitude of the investment and how it's increased from earlier times. Quite an interesting uh, lack of effect, I would say, or even reverse effect. And the big effect is in the service industries. We have evidence that the manufacturing industries are able to produce at least more variety and better widgets, but in the service industries, there's flat productivity. We're in the service industry in healthcare, and a worse part of the service industry is called the knowledge industry. Expenditures keep going up on a worldwide basis. We keep believing in the technology with no macroeconomic evidence of its effectiveness, at least convincing macroeconomic evidence. And the computers we're using at every stage are getting more powerful according to Moore's law. They double in power every 18 months approximately. So we're using more and more powerful systems, more and hopefully better and better software. Well, maybe the effect is delayed or maybe there's a cause. Well, here's some of the reactions to that Strassman who's written quite a bit in the area of productivity and related to IT, says that it's unlikely from his studies that lags are the cause. We would have still seen the effect. Others say IT it primarily enables enhanced variety, flexibility, and so on. So it makes our organizations more flexible or it gives us more widgets or more possible services we can deliver and better customer satisfaction. And IT investments are positively associated with firm output. So if you get down to the level of, an individual, of individual companies, the output, which is volume, you can show that effect. But the relationship with business performance, the profitability or success of the business, is, if anything, ambiguous. So we don't have the real evidence when you start coming about real outcomes, and they're better always, rather than just how many, there's a problem. In fact, it's a big deal. We've spent about $1 trillion in the last 20 years, uh, but realized little improvement in effectiveness. One of the points that's been made is that people believe the reason we started seeing a lot of re-engineering is people have done that in the hope to, to improve the situation, to so change the work processes, align them with IT that might work. But they got it wrong. They focused on uh, the technology and the, and the details. They didn't focus on the kinds of skills that people need, the organizational changes, and they didn't notice that the central issue is people. Re-engineering through IT has not fulfilled its, prom its promise. A lot of the, of the studies show that 50 to 70 percent of the efforts to introduce IT don't live up to their goals. They don't use the corporate culture within the organization properly is one argument. We do impoverished implementations. We stick the technology in but don't spend the money on the full process of implementation, engaging the nurses, training them, making them really part of the system, getting the doctors involved, spending the money to do that. We don't really do the organizational, human organizational change. And the newer systems that we're putting in now are really cognitive tools. They're meant to affect the cognitive behaviors of providers, help them in decision-making, check whether that order makes any sense or not that they're doing, 
And there you're inserting systems into the person's thought flow, and it becomes even more of a problem to introduce them. You really better have them involved, and these systems better be tightly coupled with those thought flows that, that, that the uh, providers have. Is mismeasurement the cause? And that may be the best, uh, best explanation. Certainly where Brynjolfsson has come to. Truth is, the effect of IT, despite the magnitude of the investment, goes to the magnitude of the GDP, is still a small effect. Estimated to be less than 1%. Figures I've seen are about 0.15%. Productivity classically is the amount of output produced per unit of income, but it needs to include these uh, areas that we've talked about, the value created for customers, better health, health outcomes. Numbers are just a proxy. And we have to include all the inputs. So there has been a problem in the past really incorporating, for example, the introduction of organizational capital, the work we do to improve internal relationships and external relationships and to improve the business processes are not included in many of the measurements of input. And of course, in outputs, the quality of the final output has not been included. So we have a significant problem. And what's worse is when people have attempted to measure the performance of the, of the uh, information economy, they found it even more difficult. Do we have some evidence finally? There's some number of papers recently that said we're beginning to see that there is an effect. A workshop on IS and economics uh, uh, really felt there was a consensus that people were pulling their weight, but the, ver the returns are variable. <coughs> they did suggest moving from a question, does IT pay off, to moving to how can we best use computers, which actually makes a great deal of sense regardless, but we still have to have some evidence that this thing is Im improving the way we do things. Generally speaking, if there are positive effects, they're correlated with complementary investments, not with the technology itself or only the technology. New strategies, innovative business processes, better organizations. In other words, you have to go in and change things too, not just stick this in. I think of IT being thought of like a pill. Give it to an organization, it gets better. It's not. It's more like a lifestyle change, which fits right in in the nature of this hollowed room we're in. That's the nature of, of, of uh, what we should expect, is a lifestyle change in the way we operate organizations. <coughs> and unequivocal evidence right across the board, people admit this, remains elusive. So still to the questions, we, we don't have good answers. Is there an evidence of payoff here? Well, most of the evidence is at a firm level. Effects generally may not appear at an industry level. There's some work that's been done to show that. And generally speaking, if you put in a buck of IT capital, you're going to get an increase in annual revenue. That's, that's being claimed. And Returns on investment or returns on assets of up to 1,000% have been claimed, but more like 50 to 100% is more typical. Generally, the, the message that comes out of all the literature, return is actually on more than the technology. It's on all that change we talked about. And that change is not getting proper investment, maybe one message. There are factors that unlock the value of IT, but they are costly and time consuming. Uh, one from Brynjolfsson firms that couple IT investment with decentralized work processes. They've shown to be about 5% more pro productive than firms that do neither. So why are these cofactors not being addressed? And focus now on the health system. And I'll talk more about that. Okay, they could perceive it as too time-consuming, risky, and costly. They've got ingrained work habits. And one problem we have is the people in IS are not expert in the people in organizational issues area, which is the broad terminology given to the to the human dimensions of this. In order to over overcome this, what we've got to do is start investing large numbers of dollars in other than the IT or in addition to the IT. And we're not yet doing that. We're not yet focusing on that in any of our health systems. For the mathematicians, here's the definition. You all know this, but the other people probably don't. I was surprised that that was from Charles Darwin. So let's look at root two status and spending within the health thing. I'm going to rely heavily on the document uh, from the OHA. I won't go through this list. There are many potential, uh, potentials of IT and health, and this is from the OHA document. Um, the one I just pointed to here was manage and optimize health system expenditures. What's a little disturbing is not many of these potentials of IT really relate to improved patient outcomes. Faster is efficiency. Greater access, hard to know what that is. Speed, research. I mean, some of these are hard to pin on patient outcomes, except number one, reducing medical errors, which has been shown to be a serious issue in the health system. There are barriers to realizing this potential, and there are insufficient funding and a shortage of skilled personnel. And the insufficient funding is at two levels. One, the whole health system level, there's not enough dollars, and within each organization, a decision to allocate dollars is not being made. It's adequate uh, 
to put the technology we need in place. The technical situation in Ontario, and this applies across Canada, many legacy systems, old systems uh, that uh, really, uh, many should be replaced, but certainly a lot of legacy systems. A lot of, each hospital does this on their own. They locally implement a system. And I've even worked as a consultant in hospitals where they implement it one way in the nursing department here and another way in the nursing department there. And nurses can't switch between the two because the keystrokes are different. Incomplete suites of applications. Many hospitals still lack key applications. I was very pleased, by the way, that one of our local institutions, Cambridge Memorial Hospital, Rena Burkholder is here, has successfully gotten a Change Foundation grant to implement order entry and to test its success. And I congratulate them on that. I think that's a very important study uh, that, uh, that will be done in this region. It also might be interesting to look at the economics as well as on this side. There's a, no interfacility networks. So everybody's kind of on their own. And we're only spending about 1.7% of the operating budget related to in information and communications technologies. Compare that to knowledge industries generally at more than 5%, U.S. healthcare at least 2.5 up to 3%, and most ma academic medical centers in the United States, particularly in some in Canada, at more than 5%. Quite a big difference. You'll see even the higher ones later. So why isn't the investment greater? Well. I mean, there are problems with uh, funding. I would mention those priorities. We need a new x-ray unit. I mean, it's hard to argue for IT. And the general squeeze on the budget. Another problem, though, is I call tracking mediocrity. We go out and we sample all the hospitals that are spending money, and we do a numerical average of that. And what we do is we take all the bad spending, and we use that as a model for the new spending. Dumbest idea you can think of. But that's a lot of the way things are judged. It just doesn't do any good to do that. We track downward as opposed to looking forward. People have a huge difficulty in developing the business case. We can see why. It, it is a challenging thing to do. What's worse is that when people have introduced business cases in the past in hospitals for systems, they haven't fulfilled them. They haven't done it. We're going to save $20 million on systems, and it's only going to cost us $20 million, so it'll pay for itself, but then they don't make the $20 million in changes, so the whole thing costs $40 million. The inadequate integration of IT into planning is a problem. We're not, our IT professionals are not integrated in, in many organizations, are not integrated into the executive team, so they can't tell the executive team how they could improve healthcare itself and do things better or differently or in new ways or do new things. They're not close to the executive team to be able to make those kinds of, uh, participate in those kinds of decisions. And of course, that, that's, a, that's a, a leadership issue, especially in the business and credibility skills. How many CIOs stand there with the rest of the executive team? There are lots of potential savings. <laughs> I point out kind of one that's very interesting. Uh, about a half a billion dollars could be saved from a 10% increase in prescription fill rate because 30% of prescriptions are not filled. Now, that's interesting. That's a real effectiveness issue. I know that in hypertension management. We show that most patients on hypertensive medications don't take the hypertensive medications. It's called a compliance problem. Well, there is a very interesting way of improving things. So the cost of drugs has gone up, but most of them are not either, either being bought or being used properly. That's a problem, a serious problem, and IT may have a huge opportunity there. And of course, to eliminate the need for care providers to reconstruct the chart every time you move somewhere, go to a new hospital. I just had that test over there. Too bad, you're gonna have it again. Why? Because the labs don't agree. <laughs> and they don't trust each other is another thing. And there are many examples there. Uh, I won't go through these. I wanna point out though that Brian Haynes at McMaster did a study in area, one area I've been involved in, hypertension management, that looked at about 15 or 20 hypertensive trials, uh, computer tri uh, sorry, trials of computer intervention in hypertension treatment. And those trials overall through a meta-analysis didn't show a significant effect. So all the claims still have to be brought into question. It is very difficult to, to prove that we're having an effect. What is the OHA proposed to be done? Many things. I just outlined two of them. One is get the feds to contribute more money and it'll come, become important at the end and monitor and evaluate the investments. Very important because very little evaluation is done of the investment in IT in our health system. And uh, the Mazinkowski report, which is a kind of interesting reading, many recommendations that uh, related to the, to the uh, IT. Uh, the one I've highlighted here is provide long-term funding for IT systems. You might get a sense of Ontario and Alberta are screaming, there might be a problem in getting IT funding uh, within, within Canada. 
another definition. My own journey, I spent a long time as a consultant. I started a practice in 1971, part-time, and went full-time in 1983, and then gradually have ramped down since. I do a uh, small amount now. In areas like strategic planning, all of these with healthcare organizations, re-engineering, and probably most importantly is laboratory consolidation. I did between 40 and 50 consolidation studies uh, related to how do you bring laboratories uh, together and share key resources keeping the laboratory at a hospital as small and efficient as possible. And that is very dependent on integration of multiple IT systems across institutions. I'm going to give you some of my reflections. My observations first. Strategy is developed independently with IT from organizational strategy pretty well across the board. That doesn't make any sense whatsoever. IT strategy can't be just responsive and it can't be secondary. It's got to be part of the organizational strategy. The leadership isn't integrated into the team for IT. There's been a local phenomenon. Everybody does it on their own. There's little real peer reference. Rarely do people work together from in our institutions with other institutions. Information management is very poorly addressed, so we don't really spend a huge amount of a procurement. It's time and effort on the assurance that we're capturing key information and that that information is quality. More it's related to the functionality of the system. And many people practice whatever they practice is the best practice. Best practices defined in the industry are generally uh, used only at the best, best situations. Our procurements are flawed. And people choose information systems as differentiators among the institutions. We are this. We are that. I won't mention the company names. And that's somehow supposed to make them better or different. Often it makes it so nobody's really doing that well. Standards have not been a very high priority until recently. Implementations are very badly done, generally inconsistent and informal in many organizations. The systems are expensive uh, and they leave a lot to be desired. DOS screens are very common. Little or no re-engineering is done in our organizations. And I know that for a fact that in, in this region that there is work that goes on in that area. But the, often it are not people who are experts in re-engineering. And re-engineers don't work in each department as we introduce IT and before we introduce IT. So there are few resources to do this and few trained people. And leadership has a competency gap in people and organizational issues area. I was talking about this at the AMIA meeting in Washington. And I, a CIO got up and said, how do you expect us to afford money for dealing with people and organizational issues when we can't afford the IT? Now, normally I don't watch my time. And I, what I thought was, well, it's called competency. What I said was, is, well, you're going to have to look at that. That this is a critical part. It's all one thing. You can't just put the pill in. You've got to have the lifestyle change. And even some of the data shows that the human factors related to IT are, are the largest cost, the solid line of the human cost. But this doesn't deal with the subsidiary human cost, like consultants and the effects on staff and training of staff. This is mainly IS people. And that's only a fraction of the total or, uh, human cost in an organization. My interpretation of this, like why is this happening and what's happening here? One, knowledge is not driving the actions of IS professionals because the knowledge exists, the action doesn't exist. And that many IS professionals have not garnered the trust, the sufficient trust of the executive team. So when they make recommendations, they're not accepted or they're looked at as a secondary issue. The message regarding the human aspects and the ability and the need to put effort and resources into that just have not gotten through. It's generally not happening. The seriousness of the IT role within the organization and the fact that lives and dollars depend on IT hasn't gotten through. And we still have many amateurs in that area. That's a problem. We don't realize our organizational success depends on this, patient outcomes depend on this, and maybe even the cost of health care. And worse, there's no cogent guidance about how to proceed. Uh, what's an adequate system to, to use? Uh, what's an appropriate level of investment? What are the essential competencies required to deploy that investment? And how should we measure success, which I believe needs to include parameters of patient outcome? Can't do effective IT at the typical level budgeted is another interpretation. The models that we've developed show that the absolute minimums of expenditure are 3%. Most show 4%. So in other words, to, to, to buy an adequate set of applications, a complete suite of applications, financial, operational, clinical, 
and put them in and make them work and introduce the people and restructure costs more than 3% per annum of the budget. You can't do it for less. And then the really tiny hospitals, which are trying to use sophisticated tools, the systems, because of their expense, don't go down in cost linearly. So you end up having to spend a higher percentage in smaller hospitals. Good luck. Most small hospitals spend less than a percent of their budget on IT. I work with Mount Sinai Hospital in New York, one of the great privileges I've had for several years as a consultant. They were spending over 7.5% of their operating budget on IT and IM. Since I was a consultant, I picked on myself here. The root four is a very brief thing to say, uh, perhaps some reflections. You've probably heard of the knowledge organization. The idea of this in the literature is that uh, information, there are organizations where information is the lifeblood of the organization, uh, the food and oxygen. And if you cut off that information, you suffocate and starve the organization. Healthcare is without question a knowledge organization. You've heard uh, Senge's learning organization. We're supposed to be able to adapt based on what we learn and what we do and constantly adapt the organization. But really, in healthcare, we should be talking about an intelligence enterprise because much more than data or information is involved. Sure, we have data sources like what patients exhibit in, in symptoms and signs and events and so on. We have information resources too, though, databases, diagnostic services, records. But we also have intelligence sources, decision uh, rules that are in inside the provider's head or in pre-existing care maps uh, or in uh, external trial sources. So, you know, it really, this is an organization that fits into that knowledge organization, at least category, if not above. And overall, in the knowledge industries, 5% of their budget plus is spent in IT. We are so far below that we cannot be even a knowledge organization, let alone a, as an intelligence enterprise. So there's, there's got to be a problem here. We're not that good that we can get away with, uh, with that. Since that's somewhat academic. Conclusions. This is our destination. What did I get out of all this? And what I hope you get out of all, all of it? You're going to yell and say, uh, boy, there's real evidence that IT improves things. Uh, it's ambiguous whether that's true or not on a whole economy basis. You get down to the firm level, the data is better, the results are a little bit better, but it still eludes consensus whether that's true or not. So you can't make just these claims. There's got to be more evidence than that. In order to really get that evidence, we have to measure the productivity of the system. That's a problem with service organizations and particularly knowledge and we call them intelligence enterprises. We've got to measure patient outcomes, and that's a challenge. We're not measuring outcomes at this time. We don't have that implemented in our system. We're sort of a parameterization for that. And rather, we're measuring proxies. So it's very difficult to develop macroeconomic data. It just isn't there. And we appear, by every way you look at this, to be substantially underinvesting in IT, particularly in Canada. What do we do? You know, what, what, uh, in order to catalyze further investment, it would be great if we could show evidence of productivity improvement. Why do we expect the feds to pour that bucket of money in? But of course, the problem is that people have been making the investment only in one side. And when dollars generally go into an organization today, they go mostly into the technology and maybe into some IS people, but not into the areas we've talked about, particularly the organizational aspects. So there's a problem. It isn't just putting the money in, it's got to be put in the right places. Now, we can't get this evidence of productivity improvement until we invest sufficiently. Think that's a catch-22. We're, we're stuck. So what are we going to do? Well, we've got to intervene here somehow. Well, it would be nice if we could do a, the world's best macroeconomic study. It's going to be extremely difficult, given the picture I painted. Perhaps more viable would be to look at the next two. Do a credible study across selected organizations while intervening and making sure that you invest sufficiently. Or look at specific applications. Another part of the literature I didn't have time to incorporate here is that one group has recommended just look at each application, not even the whole application suite, but each application, but do quality studies so that they're believable and make sure you actually do the outcome. So if you say you're going to run the department this way, if you invest this technology, then do run it this way and do, in fact, restructure the staffing to evaluate uh, the impacts. Well, here's a perfect instance in this region to look at an area like order entry and results reporting. But neither of the two of these will work unless the other issues are part of the investment. And the warning is, this is not a technology problem. It's not even an IS problem solely, but rather the broader construct of IS that I propose that includes re-engineering and organizational change, planning, re-engineering, uh, and we have to follow through 
regarding restructuring. We have to actually do it. Um, I think one of the, the things is uh, we also have to restructure the IS function within our organizations. Personally, I believe that one of the areas of opportunity, I'm uh, meeting with the economics faculty this week, and it's going to go in another couple, two weeks, we have another meeting, is to launch an economics and health, I, uh, health IT study, or IT and health trial. Look at the right organizations, select the right organizations, study it beforehand, estimate the, and choose the organizations with the greatest potential. Project the changes that will result. So like Babe Ruth, I'm going to hit them over there. Uh, and then under controlled conditions, make sure the systems are brought up to specification because what they have may be junk or not complete. And intervene organizationally, effectively. Then make sure the changes occur. Have full buy-in of the organization. Have the proper team there. And measure both the applications and the total after. If we did that, it might be possible to establish should say an economics evaluation unit that provided the safety factor that the feds are going to need to put in the extra billions of dollars that everybody's requesting. Because I don't think the feds are going to think that it's going into IT. One problem we have is that when money's put in, it can be redistributed in the health system. And it may not end up where we want it to. Final recommendation comes from a recent article in a new journal by Dennis Prati. Uh, he used to be the chairman at, uh, in the uh, health information area at uh, UVic. He said, what might Canada learn from the UK or that country? I think this is a good fit slide. The answer is commit, commit, commit. The only thing I'd add to that while evaluating. Franz Kafka's contribution. Thank you very much. So the objective